Part One of I Was a Teenage Secret Weapon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phil Chenevere. I Was a Teenage Secret Weapon by Richard Sabia. Part One. Get away from me! screamed Dr. Berry at the approaching figure. "'But I got to feed and water the animals and clean out the cages,' drawled the lanky eighteen-year-old boy amiably. "'Get out of this laboratory, you hoodoo!' shrilled Barry. "'Or I swear I'll kill you! I'll not give you the chance to do me in!' Toe-headed Dolliver Wims regarded chubby Dr. Barry with his innocent green eyes. "'I don't know why y'all fuss at me like you do.' he complained in aggrieved tones. "'You don't know why?' shrieked two hundred and eighteen pounds of outraged Dr. Barry. "'How dare you stand there and say you don't know why?' Barry flung a pudgy hand within an inch of Wims's nose. Slashed across the back of it like frozen lightning was a new jagged scar. "'That's why!' he shouted. Barry twisted his head into profile, thrust it at Wims, and pointed to a slightly truncated earlobe. "'And that's why!' he roared. He yanked up a trouser leg, revealing a finely pitted patch of skin. "'And also why!' he yelled. He paused to snatch a breath and glared at the boy. "'And if I wasn't so modest, I'd show you another why!' "'Can I help it if you're always having accidents?' Wims replied with a shrug. Barry turned a deeper red, and a dangerous rumble issued from his throat, as if he were a volcano threatening to erupt. Then, quite suddenly, with an obvious effort, he capped his seething anger and subsided somewhat. Through taut lips he said, "'I'm not going to stand here and argue with you, Wims. Just get out. But the animals, you can come back in an hour when I've finished running these rats through the maze. But I said out! Barry leaped at Wims with arms outthrust, intending to push him toward the door. But Wims had stepped aside in slight alarm, and the avalanche of meat plunged past and into a bench on which rested a huge multi-level glass maze, which was a shopping center model being tested to determine a design that would subliminally compel shoppers into bankruptcy. There was a sustained and magnificent tingling crash, as if a Chinese wind chime factory was entering a typhoon. Berry skidded on the shards into a bank of wooden cages, and went down in a splintering welter of escaping chimpanzees, Wistar albino rats, ocelots, and other assorted fauna. Wims moved forward to help extricate the stunned Dr. Berry from the Everest of debris in which he sat immersed. "'Don't touch me!' Berry screeched. "'Okay,' Wims said, retreating. "'But I guess y'all gonna blame me for this, too.' Barry's mouth worked convulsively in sheer rage, but he had no words left to contain it. He put his head on his knees and sobbed. The other psychologists of the research division came crowding into the laboratory to seek the cause of all the tumult. "'What happened?' Dr. Wilhelm inquired. "'Well, Doc Barry has gone and riled himself into another accident,' Wims informed him. I suppose you had nothing to do with it? Wilhelm snapped. Can't rightly say I had. He worked it out all by himself. Just like the rest of us, I suppose, Wilhelm said with unconcealed hostility. Well, now y'all mention it, Doc. I ain't never seen such a collection of slip-fingered folk. Always busting either their gear or their cells. Listen, you. Now, look at Doc Castle up on top of that locker. Huh, he's gonna bust a leg if he don't quit fooling with that critter. Wilhelm turned to see Dr. Castle up near the ceiling, 
trying to get at a chimpanzee perched just out of reach on a steam pipe. Castle, are you crazy? he cried. Get down from there before you hurt yourself. But I've got to get Zaza into a cage before one of the cats gets her, Castle protested. Just then an ocelot leaped for Zaza, and she leaped for Dr. Castle, who promptly lost his balance and plummeted toward Dr. Wilhelm, who foolishly tried to catch him. They all crashed to the floor and lay stunned for some moments. Castle attempted to rise, but he sank back almost immediately with a grimace of pain. "'I think my leg is broken,' he announced. "'Well, I told you,' Wim said. "'Ain't that so, Dr. Wilhelm?' Wilhelm attempted to hurl Zaza at Wim's, but found to his surprise he could only wriggle his fingers. The effort sent little shivers of pain slicing through his back. By this time the laboratory was resounding with the fury of a riot sale in a bargain basement. Sounds of destruction, counterpointed with cries of pain and imprecations, increased as the staff pursued maddeningly elusive animals through a growing jungle of toppled and overturning equipment. At the far end there was a shower of sparks and a flash of flame as something furry plunged into a network of wires and vacuum tubes. Two hours later Dr. Titus, the division chief, strolled in just as the firemen quenched the last stubborn flames. He surveyed the nearly total ruin of the laboratory. Really? he said to a thickly bandaged Dr. Berry, who was attempting to rescue an undamaged electroencephalograph from a gleeful fireman's axe. Can't you test your hypothesis without being so untidy? Dr. Berry whirled and struck Dr. Titus. Of course you know what this means, Titus said calmly, rubbing his jaw. I'll just have to have a closer look at your Rorschach. You can just go and take a closer look, Berry snarled. Now, now, Titus said soothingly, why don't we just go to my office and find out what is disturbing us, hmm? The axe came down on the encephalograph, and Berry burst into tears and allowed Titus to lead him away. Titus seated himself at his desk and waited for the sobbing Berry to subside. "'That's it,' he said unctuously. "'Let's just get it out of our systems, shall we, hmm?' Barry stopped in mid-sob and became all tiger again. "'Stop talking to me as if I were a schizo,' he roared. "'Now, now, we are not going to become hostile all over again, are we, hmm?' "'Hmm, oh, you want to, Titus.' But you'll change your tune soon enough when you hear what happened. It was no band-aid brouhaha this time. I've warned you time and time again about whims, and you've chosen to treat the matter as airily as possible, almost to the point of being elfin. However, the casualty list ought to bring you back down to earth. Berry ticked off the names on his fingers. Dr. Wilhelm hospitalized with a broken back. Dr. Castle, a broken leg. Dr. Angelillo, Dr. Bernstein, Dr. Moranus, and four lab technicians severely burned. Dr. Grossblatt and two assistants badly clawed. Dr. Cahill, clawed and burned. And no one knows what's wrong with Dr. Zimmerman. He's locked himself in the broom closet and refuses to come out. Twelve other people will be out a day or two with minor injuries, including your secretary, who was pursued by Elvira the orangutan, and is now being treated for shock. Titus protested. Why, Elvira wouldn't harm. Elvira has been misnamed. Elvis might be more appropriate. Why, I had no idea, Titus mused. Now I'll have to rerun those tests with a new bias. Berry flared up again. You don't even have a lab left to run a test in. You can't keep Wibs after this. Are you blaming poor Wibs for what happened? How can you sit there and ask that question without choking? Ever since that two-legged disaster was hired to sweep up, 
Everybody in the Psycho Research Division has suffered from one accident after another. Even you haven't remained unscathed. Why, within the month he arrived, we lost the plaque we had won two years running for our unmarred safety record. In fact, the poor fellow who came to remove it from its place of honor in the staff dining room fell from the ladder and broke his neck. Guess who was holding the ladder? I was there at the time, Titus said, and I saw the entire performance. Wims did nothing but hold the ladder as he had been instructed to do. Old John, instead of confining his attempts to do what he was doing, kept worrying about whether or not the ladder was being held firmly enough, and, as could be expected, he dropped the plaque, made a grab for it, and down he went. Don't you think it significant, Titus, that old John had been the university handyman for eighteen years, had climbed up and down ladders, over roofs, and had never fallen or had a serious accident until whims came upon the scene? And this is just about the case with everyone here? Yes, I think it is very significant. Then how can anyone but whims be blamed? But whims never has the accidents. He never gets hurt, not so much as a scratch. The devil never gets burned. My dear Barry, let the scientist in you consider the fact that never yet has Wims so much as laid a finger on any of our people, and Wims never knocks over equipment, or lets things explode, or sets fire to anything. I find it very odd that it is only my staff that does these things, and yet to a man they invariably fix the blame on an eighteen-year-old lad who seems to want nothing more out of life than to be liked. Don't you find it odd? The only thing I find odd is you're keeping him in the face of the unanimous staff request to get rid of him. And have you ever thought of what my reason might be? Dr. Berry looked hard at Dr. Titus and said with unmistakable emphasis, Some of your people think they know. It took Titus a moment to fully understand. Then he said severely, Let's discuss this sensibly. There's no point in further discussion. There's only one thing more I have to say. I'm not going to endanger my life any longer. Either Wims goes, or you can have my resignation. Are you serious? Certainly. Well, then, it was pleasant having a good friend as an associate. I'm certain you will easily find something more satisfactory. Of course, you can depend on me for a glowing letter of reference. Berry sat open-mouthed. You mean to say you'd keep a mere porter in preference to me? Titus regarded his steepled fingers. In this case, I'm afraid so. The telephone in the outer office rang several times before Titus remembered he was without his secretary. He pressed a stud and took the call on his line. He identified himself, and after listening a long while without comment, he spoke. That's very good, General. Two weeks will be fine. You understand, he must be commissioned as soon as possible— perhaps at the end of basic training. Of course I know it's unheard of, but it's got to be done. I realize you are not too happy about being brought into this, but someone on the general staff is needed to pull the necessary strings, and the President assured me that we could depend on your complete cooperation. Titus listened, and when he spoke again, a trace of anger edged his voice. I don't know why you are so hostile to this project, General. If it succeeds, the benefit to the free world will be immense. If not, all we stand to lose is one man, no equipment to speak of. Not even face, since it need not ever be made known. A far cry, I must say, from the military, whose expensive Roman candles, when they do manage to get off the ground, keep falling out of the sky and denting Florida and New Mexico with depressing regularity. Goodbye. Titus hung up and turned to Barry. Now, my dear Barry, 
If you'll withdraw your resignation, we can go and have dinner and plot how we can milk more funds from the university to refurbish the lab and keep ourselves from getting fired in the process. My mind is made up, Titus, and all your cajoling will not get me to change it. But Wims is going, Titus said, nodding toward the phone. In two weeks he will be in the army. Barry's face went white. Heaven preserve us, he gasped. Really, my dear Barry, for a jolly fat man you can be positively bleak at times. Let's get the finest dinner we can buy, Barry said. It may be one of our last. Private Dolliver Wims liked the army, but was unhappy because the army did not like him. After only two weeks of basic training, his company shunned him. His non-coms hated him, and his officers, in order to reduce the wear and tear on their sanity, often pretended he did not exist. From time to time they faced reality long enough to attempt to have him transferred, but regimental headquarters, suspicious of anything that emanated from the Jonah Company, ignored their pleas. Now, in his third week of basic, Wims sat on the front bench in the barracks classroom, an island unto himself. His company, now twenty-two percent below strength, and the survivors of his platoon, some newly returned from the hospital, were seating themselves so distant from him that the sergeants were threatening to report the company AWOL if they didn't move closer to the lieutenant instructor. The lieutenant watched the sullen company reluctantly coagulating before him, and inquired facetiously of the platoon sergeant. Prisoner of war? No such luck, the sergeant replied grimly. Be seated, men. The lieutenant addressed the company. Misinterpreting the resentment of the recruits, he decided a bit of a pep talk was in order. I know a lot of you are wondering why you're in the army in the first place, and secondly, why you should be afflicted with the infantry. As civilians, you've probably heard so much about the modern pentomic army with its electronic and atomic weapons and all the yak about push-button warfare. You figure the infantry is something that should be in the history books with the cavalry. Okay, so let's look at the facts. In the forty-five years since World War II, there have been almost as many localized brush-fire wars as the one now going on in Burma. Sure, there's still a limited use of tactical atomic weapons, but it's the infantry that has to go in and do the winning. So far, nobody wants to try for a knockout and go whoosh with the ICBM. So, no matter how many wheels or rotors they hang on it, it is still the infantry, still the queen of battles, and you should be proud to be a part of it. With the exception of one recruit, sitting alone on the front bench and leaning forward with eager interest, the lieutenant observed that his captive audience was utterly unimpressed with his stirring little thought for today. He knew he could find more esprit de corps in a chain gang. He shrugged and launched his scheduled lecture. Because of the Pentomic Army's small, mobile, and self-sufficient battle groups, and the very fluid nature of modern warfare, the frequency of units being surrounded, cut off, and subsequently captured is very high. As early as thirty years ago, in the Laotian War, the number of prisoners taken by all sides was becoming increasingly unmanageable, and so the present system of prisoner exchange was evolved. At the end of every month an exchange is made, enlisted men, man for man, officers, rank for rank. This is an advantage for our side, since generally, except for the topmost ranks, no man is in enemy hands over thirty days. This makes any attempts to brainwash the enlisted men impracticable, and a great deal of pressure is thereby removed. So if you're taken prisoner, you have really nothing to worry about. Just keep your mouth shut and sit it out till the end of the month. The only information you're required to give is your name, rank, and serial number. There are no exceptions. 
Don't try to outsmart your interrogator by giving false information. They'll peg you right away and easily trick you into saying more than you intend. Now you'll see a film which will show you the right and wrong way to handle yourself during an interrogation, and a lot of the gimmicks they're liable to throw at you in order to trick you into shooting off your mouth. The isolated and unnaturally attentive Wims again caught the lieutenant's eye. You there, he said, pointing at Wims. Come and help me set up the screen. Wims rose to his feet, and one of the platoon sergeants leaped forward. I'll help you, sir. Wims, sit down. I asked this man to help me, sergeant. But, sir, another platoon sergeant and corporal were already on the platform. They had seized the stand and were unfolding it. The lieutenant spun around. What are you doing? We're helping, sir, the sergeant said. Well, cut it out. You noncoms are too officious, and it's unnatural. It makes me nervous. Wims was now on the platform and had taken hold of the screen cylinder. One of the corporals was tugging at the other end, trying to get it away from him. Let go of that screen, the lieutenant roared at the corporal. Wims, misunderstanding, released the cylinder a fraction of a second before the corporal did, and the corporal went tumbling backwards, knocking the lieutenant off the platform and demolishing the loudspeaker. The top sergeant raced outside and found one of the company lieutenants. Sir, you'd better move the company out of the building right away. Why? It's Wims. He's being helpful again. The lieutenant paled and dashed inside. He took no time to determine the specific nature of the commotion which was shaking the building. He managed to evacuate the company in time to prevent serious casualties when the structure collapsed. End of Part 1